Before we get started, let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you that although you created everything, the universe, you created all things, that you are mindful of us. Who are we, Lord, that you should be mindful of us? We are such a speck on a speck in a universe of specks. And yet, Lord, you incline your ear to our prayers, your heart to the things that we say and what we do here. I'm very honored, Lord, by your presence. None of us deserves it. And yet, here we are. Lord, we do want to serve you. All things are for you. And so, Lord, because of what you've done, because you sent Christ, you came down in the person of your son, showed us how to live a life, taught us about who you are, and we return the favor by killing you. Lord, I pray for your mercy today. You know our lives, you know our hearts, you know the places in which we live, and Lord, you know the pressures that are upon us in these the end times. I pray that you might give us special mercy and grace as we go through your word, that you might strengthen our hearts, sharpen our minds, and that you might help us to look and to be like you in every way. I thank you for the worship, Lord, the opportunity to express our love toward you and to remember who you are in our lives. I pray that by your spirit, you would speak to each one of us today by your word. We give you this day and this time and ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's give this a shot, shall we? In the last weeks, we've been going over the life of Abraham. So if you remember... In chapter 22, the Lord asked him to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and bring him to a mountain that I will show you, and I want you to sacrifice him. A son that he had to wait for many years to get, God asked for him back. And Abraham did, and he was obedient. This is one of those tests that he actually passed very, very well. But it was after a long preparation, if you remember. He takes him up to this mountain, Mount Moriah, which you might know as Mount Calvary, and takes his son, and as his son carries the wood up the hill, he says, Father, we have the fire and we have the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And he says, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. Actually, the Lord himself will be the sacrifice. And he names the mountain on the mount of the Lord, it shall be given. So he knows he's doing something prophetic because God has a problem reconciling the promise of all of his descendants coming, as many as are like the sand on the seashore, or the stars in the sky. And he says, I need to sacrifice him. He had me send away my other son who I created in my own willfulness. God has a problem fulfilling his promise but I'm going to be obedient. And he goes. And he's willingly tied by his father. He's not a little child. He's in his early 30s, much like Jesus was, the very picture of Jesus Christ, consenting to his own death in obedience to the father. And he raises the knife, and he's ready to do the sacrifice. And, of course, because men need to be told everything twice, the angel cries out, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. <laughs> and he says, you don't have to do that. And there's a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. A very picture of who Jesus Christ was when he was on the cross wearing a crown of thorns. All of it tying together as a picture of who Jesus is. And so Abraham sacrifices the ram, gives thanks to God, and goes down the hill. And away he goes. So, in Genesis 23... In Genesis chapter 23, we see Sarah dies. Finally, after a long period of time, she's finally lived, and she's the only woman who's mentioned by age at how, long she, how old she was when she died. 
It's very significant. And so we saw Sarah go. And we see a wife for Isaac. And he makes his servant swear, listen, put your hand under my thigh. And swear to me that you will not take my son back to where I came from and get a wife from there. And swear to me that you will not take a wife from here, but you go back to where my relatives are and you get a wife for my son there. So he's going to fetch a wife for his son. It's a good thing he's taking care of this now because when he dies, it would just be left up to his son, I suppose. It's an interesting thing. So he goes and he gets Rebecca and all of the things that happen in the way that he's able to meet her and uh, just the Lord answering prayer and blessing him. He finds Rebecca, goes into the household, explains the whole deal. And they say, well, this is of the Lord. We can't say it's good or bad. So yeah, you may take her. And then he says uh, the next day, okay, I'm ready to take her. And he goes, well, wait a minute. You know, why don't you let her stay here a while? And he says, don't hinder me. This is of the Lord. And they said, well, well, we'll check with her. We'll see what she wants. She'll never want to do this. Hey, what do you think, Rebecca? You want to go with him? I will go. And she willingly goes. And when she sees Isaac far off, she goes, who's that guy? And the servant says, that's my master. And she gets down off her camel and she walks over to him and then the servant explains everything and he goes, ta-da. And he takes her into Sarah's tent and she becomes his wife. Pretty cool stuff, right? Who needs a romance novel? They should do this on Hollywood. So it's interesting, all of the pictures that we see of Jesus Christ in the church we saw that last week. Abraham, of course, the type of the father who's making a gift, a bride for his son. Did you ever think of the church as the bride that's a gift of the father to the son? That's who we are. We looked at Isaac as a type of Jesus, the son who's sacrificed. We look at Sarah, who's a picture of Israel. And we see that Israel in 70 AD, everything came down, right? And essentially all the whole sacrificial system died. We should be glad because the Gentiles are now able to come to Christ because the Jews have rejected him. And, and what we see as a tremendous tragedy is actually our opportunity. Right. And God's going to bring them back too. Uh, 9, 10, 11 chap uh, chapters in uh, Romans will tell you that. There's this unnamed servant. It's interesting he's not named and he's a picture of the Holy Spirit. You have to go way back to find his name, which is Eliezer, which means comforter. Interesting picture of the Holy Spirit. There's these 10 camels represent the law, which she actually descends off the law and walks over to him before she becomes wed, which is we're no longer under the law. We're under grace because of this forgiveness that comes in Christ. Rebecca is a bride and she's the picture of the church, the father's love gift to the son. And Laban, who's her brother, comes out and negotiates. He sees the ring that got popped in her nose, which I wouldn't recommend just going and doing that. And the, and the gold bracelets that were on her wrists that this unnamed servant just gave her, and it's interesting, is the unnamed servant gave her gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so all of these things tying in even to the New Testament and Laban being a picture of the fleshly person, the person who's interested in, in the cash and about, you know, he's got his mind on his money and his money on his mind. So this week... We're going to look at Abraham and his family because Abraham dies eventually. But before he does that, at the ripe old age of where he is, and I use the word ripe, he was well stricken with ears, the King James says. He takes another wife. So this is the other Mrs. Abraham. So we're going to take a look at that. Abraham again took his wife, took a wife, and her name was Keturah. By the way, Keturah means perfumed. That's a pretty good name, right? Yeah. Keturah. And she bore him, bear with me, Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and L Lamim. 
And the sons of Midian were Epha, Epher, Hanak, Abida, Elda, and all of these were the children of Keturah. Hooked on phonics. <laughs> By the way, this is somewhere between his 137th birthday and his 175th birthday. This is not a midlife crisis. <laughs> this is Abraham moving on with his life. And how many children does she have? Six children. You know why? Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. You see, when God fixed him to be able to have children, he fixed him good. <laughs> and he was able to continue on with a life afterwards. And it's actually listed in 1 Chronicles 1 that she was his concubine. So what happened is she actually moves up in rank and she becomes an official wife with certain rights. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. You guys know that? Yes. If God has called you to a thing, it's a done deal. If you think you can run from it, talk to me. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Because the Holy Spirit's like a gigantic rubber band. And the further you go, the tighter it gets. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The crowd went wild. You might recognize some of these names from this map over here, Midian, Didan. You guys know where this is? That's Saudi Arabia. Very good. You guys know that whole thing. You're so smart. It's Saudi Arabia. And so she becomes the mother of all of these Saudi Arabians. Actually, there's the Bedouins and the Saudi Arabians. So she becomes the mother of all of those who are actually the daughters of Abraham. And the sons and the daughters of Abraham through Keturah, not through Sarah. Just so that you understand how that whole family got put together. So this is, how, this is what it looks like and I probably should have pulled this up instead of trying to misread everything. This is the line. And it's interesting, whenever you get into these passages with all these names, you're like, oh, what a great devotion I'm going to have today. And you have to go through all of these, you know, names. They're important because we're following, and you'll notice that there is a particular line. It's almost like being woven through time, and we're given all this because we're going to come to the pinnacle of all history, which is the birth of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. So whenever you see all those names, you can sigh and roll your eyes and you know get hooked on phonics and try to make your way through, but understand that there's a purpose. These are the official records, so you know who you're related to. Any of you have like a long family tree? Any of you? Came over on the Mayflower or, or something? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting because I have no idea. I'm, I'm so mixed up and I have so many people from everywhere. I'm, I'm everyone. So here's, here's the family line. And as we go down, you're going to notice that God will explain everything. And he kind of explains the, the, the peripheral and the not so important families. And then he zooms in on the one that he wants to talk about and then follows that one. And then you get explained the whole history of how that family expanded, and he zooms in on one. And then he expands it again, and he zooms in on one. So that's what we're doing when you look at this. And it just keeps going. There's this cross-pollination between the people of uh, Keturah and of Ishmael and Esau. So some of those people are intermingling, and it's really hard to trace them back. Uh, but these are not the Persians or the Iranians. These are actually the people of Saudi Arabia and Syria and some of the area over in there. But I digress. And this is where it goes. If you follow the scripture, all of this being mentioned in the scripture goes right down to Jesus himself, right at the bottom. And it doesn't matter when David's king, there's one line that goes this way, there's one line that goes this way. One is Joseph's line, one's Mary's line, but they both are legal descendants from the line of David. As the scripture says, when the Christ would come, he would come of the line of David from the, the root of Jesse. So he's making up for lost time here because if you remember, he, start, he, he was off to an early start and has Ishmael, not God's plan. Then finally Sarah gives birth and he had to send Ishmael away. And so 
He begins to grow up. Sarah dies. He ends up marrying again, and now he's making up for lost time. Right? Because he has six. Don't waste your golden years, boys and girls. That's the lesson I learned. Listen, I only got to become a pastor when I was 50 years old. So I'm making up for lost time. If I seem a little excitable, it might be that. Don't waste your golden years. Think about Moses. Moses got called into ministry when he's 80 years old. 40 years, he was in Egypt, knew multiple languages. He was hooked up. He had everything he ever wanted. And he discovered who he was and said, I'm going to start fixing things by the power of my own hand. And he goes and he kills an Egyptian. I don't know if he was going to take them all on one at a time, but he had to run away. And the Lord had to take Egypt out of him for the next 40 years. He's wandering around the wilderness. And then there's this burning bush. He goes, what the heck is that? There's, there's a bush burning up there and it's not being consumed. I'm going to take a look at that. And so Charlton Heston goes up. You know the story. Take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. And the Lord introduces himself. It's interesting. You don't hear anything of him having even a relationship with God before that. He's busy wandering around, shepherding not even his own sheep, somebody else's sheep, until God calls him into ministry at 80 years old. And his ministry begins for the next 40 years until he dies at 120 years. Look at Caleb. At 85 years old, he was side by side with Joshua. They went into the promised land. All of these people <laughs> dropped dead out in the wilderness for 40 years. They come into the promised land and they start taking over all of these nations that are just completely whacked out. And when it's all done and they start dividing up territory, there's a whole territory of giants that are up in the hills. And he goes, I want that mountain. Today's my birthday. I'm 85 years old and I'm stronger now than I was before. Give me that mountain. I'm taking it. And guess what he did? At 85 years old, he went into battle and he took those mountains. Old age is nothing to be put aside in the single room with the TV and a remote. Forget it. The Lord can use you more now than he ever did. Amen? Because you now know more than you ever did before. You are much more valuable and you're much more dangerous to our enemy. Michelangelo was 89 years old when he did his best painting and he was still touching up the Sistine Chapel on his back on a scaffold doing that painting at 89 years old. Don't waste your aged years, people, and don't punch out until the Lord takes you home. George Beverly Shea, you might know him because he sang at all the Billy Graham concerts. He died at 104 years old. And he was singing until the very end. At 68, his wife died. He mourned his wife, and he married again, just like Abraham. He had another bunch of years with another woman. I mean, almost as many years as I've been married to my wife, he had with his second wife. God blessed him with those years. Don't think that you're beyond being used. J. Vernon McGee, famous, uh, famous preacher from Kentucky. Maybe you know him. He's got that deep draw, you know, the, the whole thing going on. He, was, he died at 84, but he preached all the way up to the end. You have lots of people who in their old age do their best work. Michelangelo, I'm thinking of. Don't waste your final years, ladies and gentlemen. Don't waste your youth. Don't waste your life. In whatever state you're found in, be grateful, be thankful, and do what the Lord's called you to do because I'll tell you what, that is the life you want to live, is being filled with the Holy Spirit and doing God's work, blessing his people, and giving honor and glory to God. Amen? Amen. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, regardless of all these children. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons and the concubines and Abraham, that Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. While he was still alive, he sent them away. Because wherever there's a will, there's an argument. <laughs> Abraham was approaching, approaching the end and he knew that his time was coming. 
And so what he did is he cleaned out to make sure nobody would be arguing with Isaac about the possession of the land or, you know, wanting grandma's rings or, you know, whatever. He keeping them, keeping them away and he sent them away. It sounds like something very, very harsh and I wouldn't advise for you to do it unless the Lord tells you something like that. But he sends them away from Isaac because you see, Isaac is the promised child in which God is going to bless and work through. And he becomes the progenitor of Jesus Christ. He's the guy who's going to carry the promise to the next generation. And he knows that. And everybody else that's part of his other relationships, it's going to be a distraction for him. It's going to be a problem for him. So he took care of it early. My father-in-law, he, he died of, he died of cancer. When he got sick, he called me and said, listen, I got to start cleaning out the house. And so he retired and put me to work. <laughs> and things that he collected for years, things that his father collected for years. There was a giant room, it was about as big as this. It had a giant door and we opened the door and the dust came out and there was cobwebs. And, and we go in and there's all this old plumbing stuff. Barrels of brass and copper and iron and tools and you go, what in the world is that? You know, well, we're cleaning it out and we clean that thing out from front to back and his garage and his basement and everything because he didn't want to leave a mess for us to clean up later. Wise man. Abraham did the same. If you don't have a will made, it doesn't matter how old you are, make sure you get one because everybody will be battling over your stuff when you're gone. You never saw a worse group of people than a bunch of relatives who just found out you died. So, he takes care of it early. It's interesting how Isaac's always a picture of the son, right? John 13, 3 says, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and that he was going to God, you know what the rest of the verse says? He took off his outer garment, and he wrapped the towel around his waist. And he went and he washed the disciples' feet one at a time. This was at the Last Supper. Everything was given to Jesus Christ, wasn't it? Isaac is a picture of the son. That's why Abraham's doing this, because it's a picture of who Jesus is. Isaac's a picture of the only son who's Jesus Christ, who inherits all things. All things were created by him, for him, and anything we do is through him. Amen? Amen. John 17, 12 says, while I was with them in the world, this is Jesus praying, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except for the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said, I have kept every single one that you gave to me. You know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is able to keep that which you have committed to him until that day. It's not by our own power that we're going to stay in Christ. It's by the power of God inside of us. There are seven decades of life. I thought this was interesting. The first decade is spills and then drills, like math. And then thrills in your 30s. And then bills in your 40s, and then ills in your 50s, and then pills in your 60s, and then wills. And that is the process. So you, you can remember that. So those are the seven stages of your life. Um, Billy Crystal puts it a little differently. He says, when you're in your 70s, you go to dinner at three o'clock, you have <laughs> breakfast the night before, he goes on and explains, and then you're sitting there drooling on yourself, and there's a, there's a nursemaid named Emma, who your wife doesn't like, but you call her mommy. I think. So it's, you know, he, he goes through the whole thing anyway. If you, ever, you can pull that up, that's actually clean, but spills, drills, thrills, bills, then ills, then pills, then wills. That's how it goes. And this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life in which he lived. 175 years. Wow. Then Abraham breathed his last 
and he died at a good old age, an old man full of years. Actually, you notice the of years is in parentheses. That's not in the original language. It says that he died full. His life was full. Don't you want to die full? I don't want to die empty. I don't want to waste a minute. Abraham breathed his last. He died full and was gathered to his people. Interesting. Who are your people? That's where you're going. I think that's remarkable. Just that little phrase. It's gathered to his people. And his son Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave in Machpelah. What? It was a family reunion. Ishmael and Isaac both came and buried him in the cave in which Sarah was buried in. You remember he purchased it from the sons of Heth? From Ephron, not Zach. In the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, in the field in which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried in, with, uh, and Sarah, his wife. So they were both in the cave of Machpelah. And they, they still are today. You can go visit it. I had pictures of it when we talked about Sarah's death. Interesting. The most you'll ever see your relatives when you get older is funerals and weddings. And the wedding, you might not get invited to. <laughs> you know, economics being what they are, selectivity being what it is. You might not get invited to that. And so these guys actually got together. And they didn't leave on very good terms. I don't know who your relatives are or how many you have. But wouldn't it be better to have a good relationship before you go to the next funeral? Wouldn't it be good to reach out to them before, oh, hi, I didn't know you'd be here. Has to happen. You know what I'm talking about? Good. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 8, speaking of our death, Paul writes, For we know that our earthly house, by the way, that's our body, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know that to be absent from this body means we're going to be with the Lord? Amen. You're going to put off this tent. I love that figurative language. You're going to put this tent off. This is just a temporary dwelling. We're just moving through. We're aliens and strangers. In Proverbs 16, 31, it says, the silver haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. Listen, death is a glorious thing if it's found in Christ. If you've made peace with God and he's your Lord and Savior, you know that Jesus came and died for your sins, you've confessed and repented, you're in him. And when you lay your head down for the last time and take your last breath, that's a wonderful transition. We'll all miss you. You'll all miss me, I hope. Well, maybe not all of you, but many of you will miss me. It's like an old pair of shoes. You get rid of the old pair of shoes, you get to buy new ones. I'm the old pair of shoes, okay? You people. I got to go to a Pentecostal church, get some people that are excited. If your silver head goes down, it's a crown of glory. If you've lived a life of righteousness and you're doing what the Lord would have you, hey, you're in good. It's a, it's a good thing. 
When I go to be home with the Lord, I hope you guys laugh. I hope you have a, an enjoyable time and I hope you rejoice. I hope you remember things that have changed you about the word of God that have been able to bring forth there. I hope all that happens. But when I'm gone, trust me, I'll be okay. <laughs> the tent is off and I got a building, okay? I'll be, I'll be built. <laughs> Verse 11, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt in Beer Lahai Roy. You remember what that means. It's the, the well of the God who sees me. It's, it's where, you know, I told you. Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael. By the way, there are 12. Be patient with me. By their names, according to their generations, the firstborn was Ishmael, Nebajoth, Kedar, Ab Adbil, Mibsham, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadar, Tema, Jetur, Nephish, and Kedima. These were the sons of Ishmael that were their names by their towns and their settlements. Twelve princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. So who are your people? That's where you go. They dwelt from Havla as far as Shur, that's actually on the, on the southern border of Israel going towards Egypt, which is in the east of Egypt as you go towards Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. So he died with his family around him. So this, these are the, I told you, God goes through and tells you this whole lineage and gives you all of this, and then he centers in usually on one, and then he begins to tell the story. So we see that Ishmael died. It is, it is rumored that he is, or it's tradition in the, in the Muslim uh, tradition that he's buried in Mecca. And he's the father of all those who would follow uh, Muhammad, who is the prophet of uh, Islam. So he's actually, that's part of what they go to see when they go to this Kaaba, that box in the middle of the square is called the Kaaba. And there are all sorts of things that are there that are representative of other things. But this is where Ishmael is. Actually, there's a small wall. It's about three feet high and wide, and it's kind of a semicircle on the outside of the Kaaba. And that's actually where Ishmael is planted. That's where he's buried. And so uh, one of the things you do if you're a good Muslim is you make a pilgrimage to Mecca. You got to go there once in your life. It's one of the five requirements of, you know, everybody seems to have five, right? The Catholic Church has five. And, and never mind. But, and you can find this in the Quran. It's an interesting thing. One out of every 51 verses is about war. It's about killing. So there's 109 of them actually in the Quran, which is rather interesting. I, I did a little research. You probably don't care much. Anyway. The story, the story of how the, the religion got started is uh, Muhammad was, you know, a dude. And he travels here to Mecca. And in this Kaaba, there are 362 idols, various idols inside this Kaaba that represent all the various uh, gods that all of the Arabian Peninsula that they served. And he, in an effort to consolidate, picked one, the idol that was dedicated to Allah, who's the moon god. And he said, that's the one. And anybody that argued with him, he killed. And he took all of the other idols down and said, Allah is the only god. It's interesting because one of the, th the three religions in the world that they say are, you know, only have one god, didn't start out that way. There are 362 of them until Muhammad went in and cleaned house and picked one out of 362. So, so Allah is the moon god. In Genesis 16, 12, you remember the prophecy given of Ishmael and his people. For he would be a wild man. It actually says a wild donkey. Uh, which they take as a very good thing because that means independence. That means you can just do whatever the heck you want to do. 
He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. That's a very peculiar prophecy, isn't it? You're going to live with all your brothers, but you're always going to be fighting. Your hand will be against every man. It's interesting because whenever it's Israel, everyone unites. When Israel is no longer the topic, they fight against themselves. All you have to do is open a newspaper, pull up a, a news page. It's exactly what happens. So it's exactly as the prophet says. Muhammad is called the prophet of the sword for this reason. And they're proud to call it that. And this is uh, an artist's rendition. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Does that sound familiar? Just like Sarah. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. What you're looking at here is the condensed version because what you don't see is it takes 20 years. And when you're 40 years old and you have to wait 20 years to have a child, that's a long time. And that's holding on to hope. That's very familiar, right? Just like Abraham and Sarah was. And so what does he do? He prays for his wife. Men, I know lots of men that pray for a wife to get a wife, but there are much less men who pray for their wives. Pray for your wife, men. Pray for your wife, because she needs it. Ladies? Maybe they don't. Okay, maybe they don't need it, but yes, trust me, no matter what they say, pray for your wife, because they need it. Goodness sake, what a tough crowd. But you know what it's like to have a baby on your mind for 20 years? You know what it's like to be waiting patiently that the Lord would actually work? Now, he's not given a promise of any offspring. Nothing's happened. There's not a word. But he prays for his wife. And eventually, God grants his plea, but it's 20 years later. That's a long time to wait. Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Now, I don't know if you can say 60 years old that that's a youth, but it's a good thing. Children are a heritage from the Lord, from conception. Can I get an amen? amen. They're a heritage of the Lord. Not a mistake, a heritage from the Lord. And whatever circumstance it is, the circumstance is. That child didn't do anything to deserve being murdered before being born. And that's because we understand the scriptures and what it teaches. But the children struggled together within her and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? <laughs> did your wife ever say, why did you do this to me? No. If all is well, why am I like this? Now, they're stirring in her, in her womb, right? I, you know, I don't know what that's like. I, I've had some pizza, you know, do some things. But, and so she went to inquire of the Lord. So what did she do? She asked the Lord about it. Amen. She didn't go around complaining and whining and crying and, you know, WebMD. Bad news. You're going to learn so much about thousands of things that you possibly have that you're just going to be full of fear. Trust me. Go to the Lord. Amen? Amen? She goes to the Lord. Now, her husband's already been praying, right? And now she's pregnant, and now we see her pray. Look what the Lord says. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Well, that would cause a problem. <laughs> two peoples shall be separated from your body. Not pulling any punches here. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Who did God speak to? Rebecca. Not her husband. Spoke right to Rebecca. 
Ladies, if you think women's lib is a new thing, God has a relationship with a, a personal relationship with Rebecca, not through her husband, but through her. My wife has a personal relationship with the God of heaven, just like I do. I'm, I'm no better off because I stand on this stage or because I'm handsome. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. And he prophesies through her, there's two nations. You're going to have nations in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, that's not the tradition, is it? It's always the firstborn. The firstborn gets a double inheritance. The firstborn kind of, you know, spears the way, and, and everyone else kind of follows behind. They actually become the priest of the home. They become the spiritual leader. That's the nature of the traditions in which they're growing up in. Now, she's got twins, and only, only a mother could tell them apart. Uh, but there is a way. <laughs> now, the only, the only reason I remember this is because I went to school with two girls that were twins. And every once in a while, as a practical joke, they would switch off boyfriends to see if they would notice. I was, yeah, I'm like a little, that's, that's just twisted. I actually found this on the internet, so it has to be true. Here it is, explaining to a child, when a lady has two babies inside her, it is called being pregnant with twins. The reason most people have two legs is in case they get pregnant with twins so that they can safely grow them inside their legs where there's plenty of room. It gets better, hold off. The twins will feed on their leg bone of their mother to get all the bone goodness that is needed to help them grow. By the time the twins are fully grown, they will have stretched all the way down to their mother's ankles. What a beautiful world we live in. You can't believe everything on the internet, right? Okay, good. I just making sure none of you are buying this. And it's interesting that the older will serve the younger. Now that's not right. And that's not according to tradition. And later on in the Mosaic law, that's not according to the Mosaic law. And yet God says, uh -uh. I'm going to do what I want. I don't know what it is that you have in your mind that everything has to be a certain way, but God might just do a shell game with you and switch them. We should be ready for that, shouldn't we? And this isn't the only time. You have Jacob over Esau here in this case. You have Seth over Cain. Cain was the older. God blessed Seth. You have Shem over Japheth. Shem ends up being the righteous line that God blesses. Isaac over Ishmael. Ishmael was firstborn, right? Judah over Reuben. And Ephraim and Manasseh. The switch. Moses and Aaron. Aaron was the older. God chose Moses. And David over all his brothers. He was the runt taking care of the animals out in the field when they had a big party to decide who the next king was. Samuel came and said, where are your sons? The first one pops up. He goes, there's a king if ever I saw one. Tall, handsome, GQ looking. And the Lord said, do not judge by appearances. Man judges by the outward, but God looks on the heart. And he says, okay, next one. Nope. Next one, nope. He's got a bunch of sons. Nope, 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 nope. Click, click. All, all out of sons? Yep, this is all of them. Oh, wait, no, well, I got one more. But <laughs> he's nothing to look at. He's out in the field. He's the runt, you know, little redhead David running around in the field. Bring him in. Brings him in, and he looks at this little kid, and the Lord says, that's the next king of Israel. Amen. And he anoints him with oil, and declares it at that point, because God does not work like we do. We need to always be flexible. Blessed are the flexible, they shall not be broken. And so when the, her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. What a surprise, because God said so. And the first came out red. It was like a hairy garment all over. 
So they called his name Esau. Esau means Harry. So you can call him Harry. He was red. Anyway, it's, it's more like this. Our daughter was so hairy. How hairy was she? It all went away, by the way. So it's one of these things. Sometimes children are born with a lot of excessive body hair. So she was born with a lot of body hair. And presumably that body hair picks up the blood. And uh, so you come out all red and hairy like a, like a red garment. So uh, that's what it looks like when you have a monkey. Which, which we had, and it's probably all my fault. Call him Esau, which is Harry. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel so that his name was Jacob, or Jacob, which means heel catcher. I don't know what happened at the birth of my kids, but I didn't name him after the, the birth event. <laughs> you can find better ways. Anyway, Jacob, and it was... It was such that God renames them later. So that's okay. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Wow. And so we know that one of them's called Harry. Here's another one who's red and Harry. <laughs> and so the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. It's like they couldn't find anything better to say than he was mild and he dwelt in a tent. They all dwelt in tents, by the way. It's like, and he wore shoes. Of course he wore. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So he's a mama's boy. Jacob's a mama's boy. He's a bit mild and dwells in tents. Now, if you had to pick somebody and said, that's my boy. Yeah, and the mild one dwells in tents. It's interesting because, you know, most, most guys, when you have a son, you, 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 you rough them. All right, I'm abusive. It's me. I... <laughs> I roughed up my boy, and, and he's, he turned out pretty good. Uh, you know, nothing counseling couldn't help. <laughs> but you see, he favors the one son because he's, he's rugged and he's rough. And Rachel, I'm sorry, not Rachel. My goodness. Rebecca, I get them confused all the time. Forgive me. Rebecca is in love with the one whom God promised would be in charge. You see, he told her, and I'm sure he told, she told her husband. So here's the son of promise, but he's younger, not to be expected. And he doesn't seem like what's cut out to be a leader, right? Because he's a mild boy and dwells in tents. We have a problem here. Parents are picking favorites. If you have children, don't do this. It creates troubles in the home. Don't pick favorites. If you have twins and they're both the same and they're the same age, same birthday, yay. Don't favor one over the other. It's a big problem. There might be some you're more comfortable doing certain things with, but you know what? You need to make a bridge for the mild one who dwells in tents Amen. because you don't know what God's going to do through that one. Amen. And so you bless them evenly. I, I loved both my kids evenly. Luckily, I had a, a boy and a girl. I could say, you're my favorite little girl in the whole world, and I meant it. And you're my favorite young man in the whole world, and I meant it, and I still mean it. So, no favoritism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're told this. For you see, you're calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many are noble that are called. Maybe some of you are mild and dwell in tents. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things. That, that's the lowest possible denominator thing of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, 
to bring to nothing those things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God has a habit of picking empty vessels so that he might fill them with himself. Amen. Amen? Those who are weak, those who have shortcomings, those who are not, you know, most attractive, strongest, some mild people who dwell in tents. Then that's all he needs. That's all he needs. Now, Jacob cooked a stew because he spent time with mom at home. You know, some of the best cooks in the world are men. Did you know that? I just figured I'd put a plug in for the, the mild guy who dwells in tents. Jacob cooked a stew. And Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with some of that red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name is called Edom. This is Esau, and all of his people after him are called Edomites, the people of red, because of a stew. There are better ways to get names, right? They call his name Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what if, what's the birthright to me? And then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. And so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread. He didn't just give him stew. He gave him a bonus. He got a little Panera <laughs> thing on the side. Esau bread and stew of lentils. This is a red lentil soup in which they still make in this area. And when he ate and drank, arose and he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, if you remember, it wasn't even pro it wasn't given to him. It was given to the younger. The older will serve the younger. Remember. But then he this gets all confused because he swindles it out of his brother, because his brother's hungry and he's cooking and he says, "I want your birthright." I want first pick when dad dies. I want the blessing. And he says, well, what the heck do I care? All I want to do is eat. <laughs> you see, Esau is a man of the flesh. He's a man who just wants to satisfy his appetite, and he has no concern for spiritual things like blessings. So when he gets gathered to his people, what people will he be gathered with? Esau despised his birthright. He comes in from the field and he gets this thing. And it's interesting because he just went out hunting and apparently he didn't get anything that day. But there was someone else hunting. It was Jacob. And Jacob landed himself a birthright. Jacob was the one who hunted his brother. Now we're going to see later on, he really learns how to work things and manipulate from a guy named Laban a little later on. And the deceiver, the heel catcher, is now going to learn. He's going to get schooled by a pro. Esau is a picture of the natural fleshly man. So as we look through the New Testament, we can see this. Romans 8, verses 12 to 17 says this. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, just for our appetites. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, there's a denying of the flesh and there's a living in the spirit that we do as Christians that is very unlike what we see Esau doing. I don't give a rip about spiritual things as long as I'm making money. Overtime on Sunday, sign me up. It's a picture of the flesh. And if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And it's not the first death, you know, when you stop breathing. It's the second death when you're separated from the presence of God forever. Amen. That's the important one. In John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, the scripture says this. Jesus says, or John, the, the writer says, 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. That's our birthright, people. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We are not people of the flesh. We're not even, it wasn't even your mom and dad that decided for you to exist. It was God himself. And he was the one who wrote you in his book before you were ever born. Unless you don't know him. In Psalm 95, 7 to 9, it says this, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, speaking of when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. You see, we have an obligation to yield when God speaks to us. And we have to be willing to suffer some things in this life, in the flesh, because we're not going to get everything we want. And you know what? I'm okay with that. How about you? I may not get everything I want. So what? It's not about this life anyway, is it? By the way, that's you. If you're wondering, this is you. <laughs> the scripture says in Ecclesiastes 12:1, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. You will never be younger than you are right this minute. Today's the day to think about your creator. It's about to think about what your life is about, what your purpose is. And I have news for you. Without God pulling you out, you're going down. Amen? But it's his hand that he holds out for us that we can grab onto. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Jesus' voice cries out for us to be united with him, for us to submit our lives to him, to not live a fleshly life like Esau, but to be blessed because Jacob was chosen to be blessed, not because he dwelt in tents and was a mild man. In fact, it was in spite of that that God picked him so that he couldn't pat himself on the back for all the good that he gets. We're no different. We're no different. If any of you do not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I would love to speak with you about that. And all you have to do is ask God to save you. We're not going to shake you down for money. We're not going to take you in a room on the side and, you know, put a tattoo on your forehead. Nothing weird. What you need to do is come before God in the earnestness of your heart and say, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. God, save me. I believe Jesus Christ. I believe that he is who he said he is and that he is the son of God and he died for my sins. Lord, apply that to me in Jesus' name. Or a simple prayer like that. Don't write that down word for word. Bottom line is this. If you know the Lord, you have the inheritance. You have the promises. You have life everlasting. If you don't, today is the day that you can make that right. And if you want to pray about that and you want to make it right today, I'm glad here to pray with you. And we have other guys that would be love to pray with you. Okay? I'm going to move on now. Next week, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 26. And we're going to see some sojourning that occurs. And we're going to watch God bless Isaac as he moves around. And we're going to see a little bit of deja vu going on with Isaac because he follows some bad examples of his father. So <coughs> stick with us and we'll look at that next week.